Hello and welcome to the Fabulous Picture Show. I'm Amanda Palmer and this week we've got award-winning filmmaker Julia Barsha for a screening of her peace-loving new documentary, Woodsross. It's the story of how Palestinian peace activists joined with sympathetic Israelis. Not all of them is soldiers, like, they don't really hate us. To stop a wall and save these trees. We hear how a teenage girl beat off an entire army. She stands up to her dad and she says, they're not gonna do it. Just the men, they're not gonna do it. Also on the show, Romania's top directors get excited about being on the program. It gives us the feeling that it's going to be like heaven on earth. But first, Yoon Woo Ping is the most admired action choreographer in the world and he's directed his first film in 15 years. And yes, it totally kicks posterior. When I receive a script, I first read the storyline and the personality of each character, because one's personality is closely related to his or her kung fu style. The kung fu of the main character is usually very detailed. I'll design each motion or movement according to the personality of the character. When working under a Western movie director, I have to lay down all the motions and then ask the actors or actresses to rehearse them before I start filming. Do it! In the Eastern world, such as China or Hong Kong, motions are designed and then are filmed immediately. By this I mean a few motions are filmed first and then the next few motions are designed and then are filmed. While in the Western world, all motions are designed before they're filmed. For each motion, real martial art, real kung fu is used. I usually avoid CGI. CGI is more suitable to be applied to the background of a scene. Motions or movements from a real human body are the most beautiful especially if they push the human body to the limit. I use CGI only to express motions when they are beyond human limits. In the past, Fights and wars involved martial arts, knives, guns, and swords. Compared with fights and wars nowadays, it's not much different. If I'm filming a movie with a modern backdrop, I will just remove all the guns in the scenes.
In movies, you just have to emphasize and exaggerate the motions and movements. Quite useless. A typical movement in a drunken fist is like this and this. <laughs> A few years ago, a batch of exciting new films put Romania in the spotlight. Well, the cameras haven't stopped rolling there, and here's what's been happening. Most critics at the Cannes Film Festival walked out on the start of the Romanian new wave. A two-and-a-half-hour epic about a man killed by indifference in Romania's health service. But its bone-dry social humour won it the Cannes Prize for daring cinema. Two years later, an unrelentingly grim film about abortion under communism... One can outright. The follow-up from director Christian Mongyu tackles the urban legends of the same era and suggests totalitarianism was, in fact, a laughing matter. <laughs> Typical of how the new wave is now maturing. We should recover the humor that kept us alive 20 years ago as the main weapon of fighting against the system. One story tells of a scam to steal valuable jars by pretending to collect air. The anthology was directed by five leading lights of the new wave. It was really like that, and that's what made life so um, strange. It was bleak and, you know, very restrictive, but at the same time, we managed to um, laugh a lot, and that kept us alive. Gata. <laughs> the bloody 1989 revolution put hated dictator Nicolae Ceausescu up against a wall. It gave us the feeling that because the system changed, it's going to be like heaven on earth the next day. Everything is going to start well, everybody will be rich and free. And of course, in a couple of weeks, we were very disappointed. The end of communism ushered in a decade of economic depression. But exploration of this double trauma is what's driving the new wave. The main character in If I Want to Whistle, I Whistle ends up in a youth prison after his mother goes to work in Italy. This thing with the kids, and it's actually, at this point, a very urgent issue in Romania. Because these kids were left behind. Most often, the path that they found, it's not the right one, you know? The New Wave's ultra-gritty style is a reaction to the heavy metaphors used to evade communist censorship. There's just this eagerness and desire, you know, to, to tell the stories, tell them differently to what we perceived as false and stiff. Jura. The extreme realism continues with Aurora. About the reality of love, marriage and divorce, it's the follow-up to the death of Mr. Lazarescu. A lot of questions are related to this communist time that I am asking myself now. But I, I don't have answers and I, I don't really understand what happened. What I know is that we survived this communist time and we didn't fought communism. Not strictly true. Another new film tells the story of the anti-communist partisans who fought the regime into the 50s. Almost every partisan was caught because of a betrayal. And uh, this was, and I still think it is, a real problem in Romania. Not surprising, in a country still ruled by elements of the communist secret services as recently as 2004.
It's important for the young generations to understand that you have to stand, uh, to stand out for your opinions. There are strange times in Romania right now, and I think this movie uh, brings a little uh, truth to the light. In part two of screening Bujaros, I have the filmmaker here, Julia Basha. It wasn't an easy film to make, this one. No, it was not. Yeah, but what I, I mean, Julia is somebody who's made a lot of films that are not particularly easy to make, Control Room and Counterpoint, and now Budros. So tell us about this one. We really wanted to tell a story that you have not seen yet. It's mm -hmm. a story of a Palestinian village that united all political parties locally. They've managed to invite hundreds of Israelis to cross in the territories and women taking the front lines. And they were all demonstrating together using nonviolent strategies to save their land. It's incredible. Come back in part two. Hello everybody, welcome to the Fabulous Picture Show and this special screening of Budros. Can we please welcome the filmmaker here, this is Julia Basha. I'm going to sound terribly biased, I love this film. I'm glad. It's certainly another look at the Middle East. Yes it is. This is about one Palestinian village, but it really symbolizes what is possible in the region today if people come together and believe that they have a role to play in changing their futures. So hopefully after the screening we can talk more about how people can get involved because we are trying to build a movement out of it. When the Israelis began building a separation barrier that would surround the tiny Palestinian town of Budros, cutting it off from the rest of the West Bank and uprooting 30,000 trees in the process. Residents were incensed. None more so than former Fatah activist turned community organizer, Ayad Marah. لازم تكيم مخك التقليدي وتشتغل بشكل منظم. He unites feuding Palestinian factions, Fatah and Hamas. And wins the hearts and minds of hundreds of international observers and Israeli activists. <laughs> As the marches gain momentum, <laughs> the military gains muscle. <laughs> but when Ayad's daughter decides to follow in her father's footsteps, <laughs> it's the local women that begin to tip the balance. With Budros, director Julia Basha shows the politics plus peace multiplied by the power of the media can be an elegant equation for conflict resolution. We stop here. We stop. Yeah. I don't think I've seen many films that have managed to evolve in that way where you're sitting there every sort of 15 minutes and going, who else are they going to bring? Are we going to see Netanyahu next standing there, you know, holding the hands with Hamas? You must have been sitting there and going, I can't believe I found this footage. This is a very special film in that sense. But the women, I think, was an, an incredibly important part of that. Iltisam, you know, she's, she was 15 year old, year old, years old at a time. And uh, she stands up to her dad and, and she says, they're not going to do it. Just the men, they're not going to do it. So I'm going to have to organize the woman. And, and it's, a, it's a testament to Ayad's open-mindedness that he says, you go, girl. We saw the men trying to push the soldiers and everything, and none of them could do that. But I think the girls could do it. But one of the most powerful things, I think, in the film is the um, contribution of Yasmin Levy. Uh, the fact that you have an Israeli border police woman talking about what happened and the level of sort of psychological warfare that is used against her, I thought she was incredibly candid. Because 
because she had left the border police, it was easier for her to talk to us. She didn't need the official approval of um, the Israeli army. She does represent, I think, a sort of standard response uh, to what she did, which is that I did what I was told to do. I'm a Jewish person who spent time in the peace movement and Israel and out on the West Bank. I want to congratulate you on your film because I think it gives a very accurate portrayal of what is happening on the front line. One response that I wasn't expecting when I watched the film, apart from being sympathetic to the Palestinian people, I also found myself being quite sorry for the Israeli soldiers in the sense that here are these young kids being brutalised at such a young age. And I wondered when you were cutting the film, was that in your mind to show that, in fact, that they're all losers out there? Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. I think that what's happening on the ground is you, you have young Palestinians versus young Israelis and old people making decisions uh, and putting these people on, on the line of fire. Their understanding of who the other is is that they are the enemy and that they are out there to get you and that they're, if they win, you lose. And I think what's special about what happened in this village and, it is, and it's happening in many other places in the West Bank is that this model is not working anymore. People get there, say Israelis who are demonstrating together with Palestinians, and they realize that there is actually a way for both sides to win. And it, it kind of challenges you to look at it from a completely different perspective. Like to know um, how many Israelis you think are involved. It's hard to really provide a number in terms of how many Israelis are involved, especially because there's different degrees of involvement. Obviously, what we showed in the film is the very kind of uh, the ultimate hardcore activism that where you actually go there and you stand in front of the bulldozer together with the Palestinians. But there are Israelis who get involved in other arenas, especially using their skills and their professions. If you really count um, all of those levels of involvement, you, you really have thousands and thousands of people uh, who are doing this. It's still a minority, um, but it is growing. I didn't really thought that in one day I will have an Israeli friend or even I will talk to Israeli women. And not all of them is soldiers. Like they don't really hate us. But you are dividing people. Not everybody wants to see this message of hope. Yeah, I think that a message of uniting people can be seen as very controversial because depending on uh, what the goals are of that unity and if they don't reflect your own vision for how you want to see um, the, the situation solved, it can cause a lot of discomfort because it really puts you in a place of having to reject the notion that there is a way for people to come around a common goal. Uh, when we start struggling uh, in Budros, we didn't imagine that we uh, can find uh, this number from uh, friends, Israelis friends, to come to support us. It's a completely different story from the one where we're used to coming from this area. How, how can people follow this story and, and find out what's really happening on the ground? Thank you. Did someone plant you here to ask me <laughs> these beautiful questions? Um, it's all available online, right? If you go on YouTube and you Google any of the name of these villages, and I encourage you to do so, Budrus, Belain, Nelin, Nabisale, Sheikh Jarrah, you're going to find hundreds, thousands of videos about what's happening. But nobody's seeing these materials because they don't make it to the breaking news. That's w where documentary filmmakers come in, and that's what people are saying so much, you know? I keep thinking, wouldn't you love the nightly news to start with that vision of tonight, Palestinian women protect Israeli activists? You just don't see that on the news. I thought one of the great questions that your film asked was the role of the media in representing the conflict, in representing solutions in a different way. Absolutely. I just actually came back from Jerusalem and we had our first screening in Budrus, in the village of the film. And there were over 500 people of all ages, of all political parties, 
Afterwards, the leaders from the different villages that are currently using the model that Budros used came to the stage and did this incredible statement about unity and about what are the next steps for us. And the energy that I felt in that moment and the optimism, I only wished that I could have shared it on the breaking news with like, this is what's coming next. Let's help this happen. <laughs> Julia's had, as a woman, has had a, a fantastic sort of filmmaking partnership also with Jihan. They worked together first on Control Room. What has this film meant to you guys? I worry about its release in the States. When Control Room first came out, a lot of people thought it was propaganda. And it wasn't until the New York Times came out with a piece that said that the film was an important film for people to see that journalists kind of followed suit. And um, I think that when this film comes out, it's going to come out to a lot of criticism because people have not seen these images before. This is a hopeful story, um, and there's, it's during a time when people aren't seeing much hope. It's so courageous what these people are doing, Palestinians and Israelis and internationals. I'm a very privileged person that I can do um, a little bit through making films, and uh, so I, 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 I feel that there is nothing better that I could be doing with my life right now. I think certainly this film, I think that it makes all of us feel like we can engage in this. And if that just means even scrutinizing the media somewhat more, that's engagement. But um, I thank you so much for coming, Julia. Thank you all for your fantastic questions and hope to see you again. <laughs> Well, that's it for this Fabulous Picture Show. Julia, next. We're going to be following the villages that are using the model of resistance that Budro started and hoping that they're going to gain a lot of momentum. If you want to get engaged, you can follow this website and we hope to see you on the next Fabulous Picture Show. Take care. On a scale of one to ten, how would you rate this film and why? I'd probably give it an eight, eight and a half. You get to see a different side of, of, of how people are battling oppression in their countries. I think it should be made um, compulsory watching for all young adults in living in conflict areas. It was a very powerful film with a very powerful message and I would definitely recommend all my friends to come and see. Mm -hmm.